Today we're going to do a workshop tour update sort of thing because I spent the last month or so getting this space ready in order to prepare for motor swapping my BMW i8. For those of you not following along, anytime that I'm not on the couch designing things virtually, I'm doing the rest of the work in a one car sized workspace. I used to have an expansive 1600 square foot shop, but in later years I was not using it to produce revenue, so as one might imagine, that sort of space gets kind of expensive kind of fast. Not having a garage at home, I needed to do something about that, and the fastest, easiest, and cheapest way to solve this problem was to buy a literal shed. Thankfully the Amish are pretty handy with a tape measure, and the structure came in exactly to the advertised size, which made for an extremely tight delivery to my property. After some tense moments, it did get dropped into place. And speaking of measurements, this is a 14 foot wide by 28 foot deep structure. This is a little bit larger than a standard single car garage and I sized it as such so that I could open both doors of the car while being able to get around as well as have ample room in front of or behind the vehicle in order to deal with a rapid unscheduled engine disassembly. When it does come time to swap my i8, I'm not sure whether I'm gonna position the back end of the car into the garage, which is gonna be nice for access to tools in the workbench or face it out, which is going to make it easier to get the turbo three cylinder out of my life and shipped off to what is likely going to be another very unhappy BMW i8 owner with a blown up motor. Getting a car in or out is one of the bigger downsides of using a shed like this because you do need a ramp to get in and a fairly long one at that if your car is any sort of low. This generally isn't a problem under normal circumstances, but if your car doesn't run, then it's kind of a pain to get into the building. Hypothetically speaking though, there is enough room for a flatbed wrecker to back up and drop the car off right into place. Not that I've ever had to do that before. The biggest problem that I've had with this setup is that my old shop basically just puked itself into the space and it's been that way ever since. Cars can take up an absurd amount of space when they're disassembled and before taking apart the i8, I want to spend some time creating a better storage situation as well as outfit the space with some better, more compact and capable machines. On the storage front, I had picked up some new shelving units from Amazon which are going to replace the 15 year old fiberboard units that has seen much better days. I thought these were a decent buy at 135 bucks each and they're about a foot longer than the old ones. Instead of the fiberboard shelves they have an aluminum core that's quite easy to slide heavier objects across and more importantly when liquids are spilled it's easy to clean up without turning the shelves into literal dust. It's notable that these shelves are quite empty right now and that is in preparation for parts coming off the car. They're also quite empty because I threw out about six 42 gallon garbage bags of crap that I've been hauling around for years and much to my amazement I have not needed a single one of those pieces. Purging all those treasures was well worth it as it wasn't worth taking up the space so I could pat myself on the back once every couple of years when a piece of junk actually saved the day. The other side of storage that needs to be addressed was my very small, very overcrowded toolbox that I've had since I was 17 or 18. And while it holds plenty of fond memories of project cars gone wrong, it was time for an upgrade. I opted for two different Husky brand toolboxes from Home Depot, one being 72 inches, the other coming in at 52 inches long. These ended up being about $2,200 delivered and with quite a few options out there in this price range, these were just the right size and color combo for my space requirements. They also featured wood workbench tops and I opted not to install the caster wheels because these are gonna get loaded up with stationary equipment. On the topic of equipment, the first order of business is to update my FDM 3D printing situation. My 3D printing journey started with the ANET A8, which would produce failed prints while infamously burning your house down in the process. I then moved on to a Creality CR10 V3 so that I could print even bigger failures. After replacing the main board, every hot end part, putting it in an enclosure, and then heating that enclosure, I thought I arrived at some level of reliably printing nylon parts for underhood use or high stress components. The problem with a bed slinger style printer is that once you get over 600 grams of filament or so, things can go sideways, literally and figuratively. In today's world, if somebody wants a reliable turnkey 3D printing experience, you just go and buy a Bamboo Labs product. Unfortunately for me, a lot of the parts that I build are just outside the build volume of the Bamboo Labs X1C, so I had to sit on the sidelines. But that all changed with the fairly new release of the H2D, and with 3D printing being a bit of a cornerstone of this channel, I had reached out to Bamboo Labs to see if they would be interested in supplying a machine to support this channel. And a couple weeks later, here we are. The H2D represents the second generation of flagship printers for Bamboo Labs and has a build volume of 300 by 
125 by 320 millimeters, as well as dual nozzles. This is great if you want to print multicolor prints without a bunch of waste, but I'm more interested in printing complex parts with water-soluble materials such as PVA. The other option for multi-filament prints, if you don't mind waiting for the nozzle to purge between switching, is via the AMS. This machine is paired with an AMS2 Pro. This has some nice built-in features like filament drying, switching colors, and more importantly for me, swapping out spools when one runs out, so long as the AMS recognizes that it has two of the same materials loaded. I'm not usually impressed with packaging, but this was well engineered out of the box and required more removal of parts than assembly to get up and running. And after an automatic calibration procedure, we were quickly squirting plastic. For a first print, we had to do something small and comically useless. This print adapted a BMW shift knob to my drill press. With the threads printed in place, it went right on, and now I can drill much faster at the expense of having to change the bearings frequently. Next up, I printed something slightly more useful, which was the test piece for a part that I'll get 3D printed in aluminum by CraftCloud. All of the default settings for the support material and overhangs resulted in a part that came out in high quality with dimensional accuracy that verified the functionality with the mating connector. You'll be seeing a bunch more on these fittings in an upcoming video. Now that we've got a large build plate and some toolboxes that need to be situated, I went down the addictive rabbit hole of Gridfinity organizers. As this system is wildly popular, you can download existing models for just about anything you might need from Bamboo's community library with turnkey settings ready to go. If you want to design your own Gridfinity bases, bins, or bespoke tool storage, Fusion has a plugin to get you started with just a couple clicks. I printed all these in PETG carbon fiber for a level of chemical resistance, as I'm not always the best in wiping down all my sockets after a project, and I would like to avoid coming back to a gummy storage tray. The socket storage I chose is not the most efficient use of space, but it was the most flexible in creating a home for what amounts to two or three mixed sets of sockets. Printing all these Gridfinity pieces went almost flawlessly, with the only issue being some nozzle clumping with this particular filament. It seems others have experienced the same, but the printer's camera spotted the buildup and the app notified me of a potential problem. I was able to quickly pause the print, clear the debris, and then get back up and running. Another set of large parts I printed was to enable my lift cart to properly position the motor and transmission assembly into the subframe of the car from the bottom. This spaces the drive line in the correct spot so that the lift cart can be flush with the subframe and it'll float at the correct height to install the motor mounts without any struggle. I also printed another piece that puts the transmission flush with the oil pan bottom so that it'll slip right over the dowel pins and the input shaft pilot without any additional drama. The last stop on our 3D printing upgrade experience is the addition of the Sunlu E2 filament dryer. Bamboo offers a high temperature version of the AMS, but it is limited to 85 degrees C. My personal experience with nylon is that it needs at least 100 C to really drive out the moisture without the process being days long. The Sunlu dryer gets up to 110 C and has presets for various filaments to make things easy. It's a solid unit with a heavy duty build and has multiple ports in which to print directly out of depending on the physical layout of your printing setup. I verified that this delivers the rated temperature which isn't always the case with some dryers on the market and unlike air fryers or similar kitchen tools, this is designed to run for longer periods of time needed to fully dry engineering filaments. With these high temperatures you do need to make sure that the spool in which your filament is wound on is not going to deform and you come back to some really dry spaghetti. 
This is a really solid piece that will handle any difficult to dry filaments. It would be really nice if Bamboo Labs upgraded the AMS HT to an equivalent temperature capability, really for the integration features into the rest of the system, but the Sunlu E2 filament dryer is going to fill that gap for my purposes. Moving to working on the car itself, my lifting mechanism of choice has been quick jack since around 2018. Not having a concrete pad, a two post lift is out of the question for me, and traditional jack stands are just a pain to work with. However, having a fleet of BMWs, I do not want to tie up my primary means of lifting for the duration of the swap. So to remedy that, we're going to be using some 14-inch wheel cribs from Race Ramps. These are incredibly light and offer a high level of flexibility with a two-piece design. This means you can use half the wheel crib to raise the car 7 inches or both pieces for the full 14 inches. This works out for me because the quick jacks don't get high enough to put the wheels on the full 14-inch height in one go. One challenge in using the quick jacks for setup is that the pivot point means shuffling the cribs forward as it's lowered into place. This is going to make working on the i8 much easier due to the massive under tray that sits very close to the jack pickup points and is very difficult to remove when the car is raised just on the quick jacks. Being 14 inches wide, these are marketed as supercar wheel cribs for extremely wide tires, but for more pedestrian vehicles, this makes for a nice added ledge in which to place sockets or bolts so they don't roll away into oblivion like the rest of your 10 millimeter socket. The two-piece design is going to allow me to place the front of the car higher than the rear when it comes time to bleed the notoriously difficult cooling system. When you're all done, they stack very well and the lightweight allows for storage just about anywhere. One major challenge in getting the engine out of the IA is that it needs to come out the bottom. To deal with that, we're going to make some 14 inch tall adapters to get the car to a terrifying height, but it will only need to be that high for long enough to wheel the engine in and out at which point it can be dropped back down to the 14 inch cribs. We'll be using our friends over at Send Cut Send to cut these. I may ultimately add a crossbar that will attach for side to side stability. Another piece of equipment that served me well over the years was my Miller Synchrowave 250 TIG welder. While it's been a solid machine, it's just simply too massive for my available space. So we're gonna get this out of the way and make room for something else. With that space open up, it can now serve as a temporary home for the Ferrari Maserati F136 motor that I acquired for a side quest. Next was to make some room under the bench for a newer, more size efficient machine. Big shout out to Everlast Welders for coming on board to supply a replacement for the big blue box with the Typhoon 330 and WC375 cooler. This machine is gonna offer just as much power capability for those thick pieces of aluminum while offering much more flexibility in arc control. I've occasionally used an Everlast machine when I've done some on-site welding for FCP Euro whenever they manage to break some sort of cast aluminum. With the Typhoon, I was up and running with some decent aluminum beads after a few short minutes of setup. I was immediately impressed with the level of arc control over the old Transformer style Miller machine. The quick lead connection allows for a nice short cable tied directly to the workbench with the ability to install a longer cable for on-car jobs. I opted for the wireless pedal and 25 foot torch which allows me to reach anywhere in the garage with no more worry that I position the car far enough forward to reach the farthest section of an exhaust for an example. We fired up the bamboo to make a storage slot for the pedal so it's quickly accessible and easily charged next to the power outlets. I'm really looking forward to spending some more time with the machine and dialing into settings for some materials like 3D printed aluminum that I often work with and maybe some other exotic metals. As for the rest of the garage, the lathe has a new home on one of the workbench tops and I have to appreciate the technology jump between the old Atlas lathe and the new 3D printer. Another section of workbench was reserved for some electronics assembly and testing with a soldering iron, hot air rework station, and a pair of power supplies. We can't forget my decor centerpiece that has no nefarious meaning, but it's just a fun piece of history with some 45 ACP size craters. 
The only three numbers you should be concerned with is your credit score, but keep dropping those comments because the algorithm loves you for it. While my old shop had a full-size Bridgeport mill, I've lacked any milling capability in this space, and I'm looking forward to a longer term report on this desktop CNC unit made by Makara. I plan to make some more complex parts with it since most examples out in the world are pretty trivial from an automotive component standpoint. And of course, we've got more 3D printed Gridfinity organization. Rounding out the material removal department is the bandsaw that doesn't get all that much use thanks to Senka Sen. And I did end up relocating the belt sander to an unused platform on the drill press. And I have no idea why it took me seven years to do this as it frees up a bunch of room for walking around the nose of the car. So that's it for updates. It's really transformed this into a much more usable and functional space. And I realized that there's a lot of sponsored support in this one, but I do go out of my way to only feature parts and services that are directly relevant to this channel and that I find actual value in. While I am an enjoyer of money, I don't do this for a living, so that allows me to cherry pick the partners that I work with, many of which I've spent my own money with well before I ever made a YouTube video. So if you are interested in any of the stuff that you've seen here that weren't 50 year old marketplace finds, then feel free to check the links in the description because it'll save you a couple bucks and it helps out the channel as well. With all that said, if you made it this far, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.